program tonight, as I understand the topic, is balance in everyday life. And um, what do we have to balance? We have three or four things to balance. We have to balance our spiritual life, our emotional life, our mental life with our work and make it all stay even tempered. Try and hope we have even temperedness and patience throughout the whole thing. Um, is balance part of spirituality? What do you think about when you think of spirituality? We usually think in terms of piety, devotion, godliness, reverence. All of these things can bring to mind some kind of otherworldliness where we're not living here. It can bring to mind, if we say, think of, um, it's an immaterial and intangible thing, spirituality, in most cases. We talk about balance and common sense, what do we think about? We think about pragmatism, practicality, realism, a no-nonsense view of life, matter-of-fact behavior, and a utilitarian level-headed approach to life. Now, are these two incompatible? According to Swami Vivekananda, who personified both spirituality and common sense, he said, a religion that will be equally acceptable to all minds must be equally philosophic, equally emotional, equally mystical, and equally conducive to action. This has always made a great deal of sense to me because in order to even pursue religion, we have to be satisfied with what we're doing. You can't, you know, you, someone can't say that you have to do this particular act or particular ritual and they don't tell you why you're doing it doesn't make any sense to me. And if we look at all of the um, spiritual teachers, Ramakrishna, Buddha, Holy Mother, Vivekananda, the Dalai Lama, any of these people, they personify extreme spirituality, extreme living on an extremely high plane of spiritual experience. But at the same time, they're completely practical in the everyday world. Now this, to me, they maintain their balance. We look at Holy Mother's life, and we see a woman who had complete balance with her day-to-day -day fixing vegetables, cooking, taking care of her family, taking care of Radu, and at the same time lived on a plane where she was the monks who met her said she lived basically almost in samadhi at all times. She had about 10% of her mind on this world. But she accomplished more than most people accomplish. She accomplished more in one day than most of us accomplish in three or four or five weeks or a lifetime. Because she did have this extreme balance. Common sense, as, as I think it was I don't know who it said. Common sense is the least, is the most uncommon thing in the world. What, what does common sense mean? It means that you look at things and you do what's logical. You look at life and you do things logically. If someone is hurt, you take care of them. If someone is um, in trouble, you try and help them. If someone is being really obnoxious, you try and control them or stop them. Um, 
these, this kind of common sense approach and balance in spiritual life and in everyday life doesn't go in for flights of fancy, misty, um, psychic experiences, that kind of thing. This is not what we would call a balance in our lives, which Swamiji said was very necessary. We can look at, we, we were talking two or three times today about Brother Lawrence. And in the Indian tradition, Gopal Arma. Now, Brother Lawrence had total balanced life. He did all of his daily activities. He took care of everything. Most mundane things in the entire world, like counting how many bags of beans they had down in the basement, counting how much flour they had, it completely mundane daily tasks. And yet he practiced the presence of Jesus. He practiced the presence of God. So Palarma was an Indian widow who felt that baby Gopala lived with her. She could see him running around, she could see everything. Her baby Gopal took her by the hand and dragged her to Dakshineshwar, where she discovered that Ramakrishna was her baby Gopal. And so she started cooking for him, doing daily duties, everything for him, having these visions all at the same time while doing the most mundane housewife time motherly tasks. Swami Vivekananda, who totally did not believe in the visions of God or the forms of God, when asked by Ramakrishna, what do you think? He said, I think it's true. <laughs> he couldn't dispute it. He could not dispute it because he could see what was going on. Okay, then we take a look at um, Ramakrishna's life. Was he practical? He was in and out of samadhi all the time. Is this a balanced life? At one point, everyone thought he was mad to die. They thought he was totally crazy. He, has, he was absolutely you know, not of this world. When Holy Mother came to check and see if her husband was crazy. She found a very practical man who was doing, living his life at the Dakshineshwar temple, but having spiritual experiences. Rani Rashmani found him extremely practical. The Krishna statue was broken and the, and the um, temple people the other priests, the Radhakanta priests, all of the people that worked at the temple said, you have, we've got to get rid of the Murti, you can't worship a broken Murti, everything, you know, this is just, we can't do this. And so, Rani Rashmani asked Ramakrishna, and he said, well, if your brother-in-law broke his leg, would you throw him out? <laughs> so, Rani Rashmani said, will fix the tent, the Murti, Krishna, Ramakrishna did. It's still in the temple there. It's still the same one, still worshiping the imperfect image, right? But it was a practical solution. Why would you have to throw out something that you had loved for years, worshiped, brought in things? Practically, repair it. Um, I don't know, if any of you, I'm sure some of you have seen um, or read about the Dalai Lama. For his, what he used to do for his extracurricular entertainment was take clocks apart. And he loved to take clocks apart and put them back. He likes to do electrical work takes electrical things apart, to put them back together, makes them work. He likes that. He's very practical about um, his visits. One of his, um, a friend of ours interviewed him one time. And he went up and he said, you know, was trying to be 
extremely rever reverential, and the uh, Delilah just looked at him. He says, "Well, what do you think about the latest thing that's going on?" And so they talked back and forth. He's a journalist, and he said, "I was overcome with how down to earth, what common sense he had, and how he related." completely, the balance between the spirituality and leading a country that has been evicted, basically, or a religion that's been evicted from his country. And even the fact of what he has decided that the Dalai Lama may not be born again because of the Chinese situation. He said maybe this was our, this was what was meant to be, that we had to get out of Tibet so that the world could see what our religion was. Not trying to um, force anything. Keeping a balanced, rational approach to everything. And we can go back then to Holy Mother's practicality. Do you all remember reading when she was taking the food to Ramakrishna and it fell? And now you know you can't serve food that's fallen on the ground. It's totally inedible. But there was no time to cook again. So she quite practically picked it up, avoiding the dirty part, and said, well, you did this. This must be the way you want to eat it. <laughs> but we were talking about one time when very, very young in the Dante, and just learning how to do things for the Lord. And a friend told me about they had spent all night making pies. It doesn't take all night, but it did when you're young and you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> um, and they got up in the morning and there was a fly in the pies. Oh. And it was for top of food. Oh. Now what would you do? They threw it out and started all over again. <laughs> okay. It happened to people where Swami Swaminand was and they said, they had had to, you know, do this, and the, everything was late. And he said, "Why didn't you take the fly out?" <laughs> and I said, "Why did you have to start the whole thing? Just scoop it up, make sure the pious was clean, and serve it. You had, you didn't need to cook the whole thing. But totally practical, maintaining a balance, not letting, you know, a little tiny mishap, which it was a tiny mishap." throw the whole balance of the of your emotions and your mental calmness. I mean they went into tiswas. That's what we call them, tiswas. So um, entirely practical. There's another example too of practicality and balance seem to go together. When you can keep your calm and not get upset by little tiny, just tiny things that happen. To me that is balance in life. Oleron Bose was a very orthodox Vaishnavite at one point. Yeah. And he was very bothered by mosquitoes when he was meditating. But being a voice in the fight, he could not kill them. So he was going to go to Ramakrishna and ask him what to do about it. And he pondered, how am I going to ask him how to do it? What do I do about these mosquitoes? What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? He walked into Ramakrishna's bedroom, and Ramakrishna was killing bed bugs that were in his mattress. And he looked at Balaram and he said, they bother me at night and make me think of my body. And Balaram never asked the question of what to do about the mosquitoes. He just got his answer right then and there. All of these great teachers have taught us common sense and balance in our lives. Buddha was a pretty good one too. A woman came to him and was just distraught, her son had died. And can't you do something? Can't you bring him back? And he said, yes, I can. 
but you must bring me a mustard seed from a house that has had no death. So she went all around the village looking for it and would knock on every single door. Has anyone died here? Yes, you know, my grandfather died. Um, has anyone died? Yes, you know, my uncle, so and so, he got old and he passed away. And she went all day and into the night trying to find one house that had not had a death. By the next morning, she found there was no one. And she went back to the Buddha and had come to the realization that it was inevitable in life. So it, he taught her the balance. Her, her, her grief was ameliorated by that. It wasn't taken away, but it was lessened because there was no one that she had found in the whole entire area that had not experienced death in their family. So it put her mind back in balance. She could then accept things and cope. But what actually gets us to that point of having the equanimity of our mind and we've talked about this at least three or four times. I mean, you're going to hear the same thing over and over again. Focus, concentration, being able to take control of your mind and focus instead of being, as we say, you know, driven by the winds of chance. When we can approach any task, anything, any, any, situation with a mind that we have a concentrated mind that we can control we can look at the situation with our, the logical part of our mind not with our emotional reaction so what's the most today we were taking a walk and there was a huge dog that was off its leash now, you could have been, you know, it took like a second and the people put it on its leash. But in that second, without knowing that things were going to be all right, without having the concept, the focus of seeing their reliable people, they're calling their dog, we don't have to worry. We could have reacted and caused a big hoo-ha, <laughs> but it didn't because if you can keep the emotional reaction or the, you know, I would say emotional reaction, just lessen it so you can take a look at things that are going on and that helps the balance in your life. It also helps if we can, as Swamiji said, it has to be equally philosophical equally emotional, equally, um, what was the other one? Mystical. 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 That will prompt us to action. So, of course that ties straight into his four yogas. If we try and put every one of the four yogas into action every day, apply them to all of our activities, then we maintain a balance. We have to act. There's no way you're not going to act. I mean, I haven't seen anyone who can sit like a monk. And if they are, their minds are going. So they're still acting. <laughs> if we can take a hold of all of that and and direct it and focus it, as I think it was who was it said? Uh, just one second. Yeah. In, in this was, I think, Swami Vedana. So, if there's no wastage of mental energy, with a fraction of your mind, you can do so much work that the world will be dazed. It's the lack of focus and the lack of balance that scatters us. And I think every one of you can probably <coughs> tell me better how 
what unbalances a life? What kind of thing puts your life out of balance? I'm asking questions of you now. I'm going to start pointing fingers. <laughs> what puts your life out of balance? Stress. Or when do you feel like your life is out of balance? Stress. Stress puts you... Okay. That's a good one. That's tomorrow, right? <laughs> what, what, what's put yours out of balance? Blame. Hmm? Blame. Okay, blame puts it out of balance. That things don't go your way. Okay, when things don't go our way. Anger. Hmm? Anger does it. That's a real trigger one. And isn't that kind of, sometimes it doesn't stress. Well, first of all, if things don't go your way, you get a little stressed, and then you get a little angry, right? And they kind of all work together. And pretty soon you're really unsettled. And your mind is wild, going in every single direction. You're saying things you didn't want to say. You're doing things. That you're making a mess of what you're doing. Because mm -hmm. you cause more problems for yourself because you're not focused. And your life is completely out of balance. So how do we, if we start with the things don't go our way, how do we start getting it into balance? Why do we want them to go our way? And what is it we're trying to get to go our way? We trying to make other people do what we want, what we want them to do? Are we trying to um, have the day go so that it meets our schedule rather than the way the Lord decides? Things pop up and they. Take up your time, and you don't have that time, and we get stressed. It's not going the way I had. I mean, I had a routine planned out, and and they came. Someone popped into the middle of the routine and said, "We're going to have to go take the car down for a oil change right this minute." And you go, "I didn't plan for that today. That's not for today." But it, they're all little things, and if we can take a look at it, prioritize, we have time for everything in every day. We really do. When I first moved into the convent, I did not like routine. Routine and schedules were the hardest thing in the world for me. I had never lived with, lived with that many people, and everyone had their own they were all doing different things. And I was extremely, like, how do I get along with all these people? They're all doing things, that, and, and then this routine on top of everything. And I wasted so much energy fighting the routine and worrying about what other people were, whether they were doing what they were supposed to be doing, or whether I got my stuff done. I was like exhausted by halfway through the day. Literally exhausted, mentally, in every way. After a while I decided, well you may as well stop fighting the routine. The routine is the convent. Meditation in the morning, get up at a certain time, eat breakfast together. And always there was some discussion going on that got everyone kind of like, it was what we're doing today, who's coming, what's happening, and why did you say that? Then we had karma yoga. And karma yoga was, there were 12 of us, so we um, rotated all the jobs. That made you spend two months on each job. And someone had asked her earlier how you attach and detach. Well, that's what that one basically taught us. We had to go in and take over, say, full charge of the temple. That meant you did the puja, you picked the flowers, you cleaned the temple, you did everything. And it had to be perfectly done every day because we had, uh, our head nun would come and check. And I remember she used, I used, to, I 
Finally, one time I said, okay, you can come check. I know it's done right. And she came in and she went immediately up to one of those glass light covers and she reached inside and I had dusted it. <laughs> and I went, how did you find that one? <laughs> but it was lack of concentration on my part. You know, I was convinced it would be like that light fixture. And in, we worked on it for two months. If that light fixture had not been washed, she would have found it. And I was just like, oh. Okay, after about, well, I'd say four years, maybe five, I decided, well, I may as well settle down and just do the reaching and not think about it. And all of a sudden, I had all this extra time to do things I wanted to do because I quit mentally fighting it. I quit mentally thinking about how awful it was. I quit um, thinking about what else I could be doing. And the routine, the work was nothing. As soon as I stopped fighting, I got the balance back and I could get anything done. And I even remembered to wash the light fixtures. Um, and I still had time to, to do what I, what I considered my things that were we all have hobbies, or some sort of hobby. You have to have a hobby. You can't just do da, 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 keep it down your nose to the grindstone at all times. So everyone has a hobby that they like that helps the helps the work. You know, like Swami Tadatmananda. You may have seen his paintings. He did all these paintings of Ramakrishna, Holy Mother, the disciples. He painted in his hobby time. But they're treasures for the entire society. We have, you know, there's photos of them all over. They've been replicated. And they're gorgeous. They're in our temple, the big, the giant picture of Ramakrishna he painted for us. Buddha and Jesus he painted. We have a lot in our convent that he painted. And they're treasures. And they focused his mind on God because he was painting them, and he really got the thing. So we all have a hobby that we wanted to do. And suddenly when I stopped fighting the routine, I got enough time and balance that I could do pretty much, I had probably three hours in the afternoon to do what I would like to do, which is quite a lot of time. That still gave me two or three hours to study the books from the training center, and then we went to Vespers, and then we had the evening. We had the evenings fairly free after a gospel reading. But Swami Prabhupada had set up that routine, and it was really monumental in my mind when I moved in. Now it's just like, he could have made it so much more rigorous, but he didn't because he made it what well, in a, in a very balanced amount of time and what we could do and how we would have some time for relaxation and thinking, how we could look at ourselves and look at our minds and, and make friends, have time for the devotees, relax time where we weren't, you know, I'm sorry, I don't have any time to talk, I've got to go to work, which is a bad habit sometimes monks and nuns get into. I'm too busy. They don't have time. <laughs> but we have time for everything. Like all of, everyone has said, if we focus, concentrate on my concentration is the biggest thing in maintaining balance, realizing God, doing your work well, getting ahead in your profession. You can take it all back to concentration pretty much. Learning how to meditate. Concentrating. It is what, it's the basis of success in any, any endeavor. If you can concentrate and control your mind. Now blaming people. Where did that one come from? Blaming. No, when someone blames us. Oh, when someone blames us. 
Okay. Yeah, that causes a, an imbalance because our normal reaction is, but I didn't do that. I don't know why they're blaming me. <laughs> and um, one of the things that was done in this order from the time, I don't know if it was Ram Krishna, but the, the, the direct disciples, they would often scold one person for nothing. Swami said, one Swami Prabhupada, he said, I got the worst scolding and I hadn't done anything. And then he found out it really wasn't for him. So of course he did the same thing one time. When I went in, I was I cooked for him. Practically from the time I moved into the convent. That was one of my hobbies. Um anyway. And I was cooking for him in Hollywood, and he was very, very picky and particular, and he scolded a lot if things weren't perfectly done. And so I walked in, and he was yelling and screaming and scolding and scolding and scolding. And it, of course, it was a room that had more people than this. And it, they were never private. <coughs> never private. <coughs> I always had to be with an audience. <laughs> So that everyone knew that you were getting scolded, and you had no, you had not one shred of pride left, because it wasn't possible. And I kept thinking at the time, I didn't argue with him. I'd learned enough by then not to argue. And I just sat there and I went, huh. And he kept yelling and kept yelling, and I kept thinking, what is this? I, I am, I, I wasn't even around for this one. And I walked out, and one of my other sisters had been there, and she said, you know that was all for me. <laughs> and I said, really? And she said, yeah, but I can't take his school days. She said, if I had to take that, I would be shattered, and I would be in tears. I couldn't even look at anyone. I would have to go hide. And I went, oh. Well, I had maybe gotten a thicker skin by then, because he did it quite often. <laughs> and. I had to balance that one out and not have hurt feelings. So I said to myself, because I'd read it somewhere, a guru's scoldings are very beneficial. What they're doing is burning your karma quickly for you. And I kept telling myself that so that I could go back in right after these horrible scoldings and be sweet and nice and really feel it. And I think he's really helping me. He's burning my karmas. One time, I didn't hold it together so well, and I walked out, tears streaming down. Swami Chaitanya said, you know he's burning your karmas, and I was not nice. I snapped at him, <gasps> snapped at Swami Chaitanya, and I said, don't you think I know that? Do you think I take this from just anyone? <laughs> and he went, no. <laughs> but I mean, now you have to understand, we weren't that far apart in age, and he had just come, and we were like siblings at the time, so it was not as as bad as it would be today. <laughs> but um, yeah, now Swami Swahananda used to do it to his sevaks. He would scold them until they were just like. But it's exceptionally good training to keep your mental balance. And it's except when you can take their scoldings, someone you love dearly, and these scoldings have nothing to do with anything. But when you can train your, they help train you to keep that mental balance. They're pretty much you you know that these are all superficial. You can take it out into the the world, and you can say when someone gets mad at you, does this really have to do with me? Or is it some problem they're having? If you can analyze things like that, then you can 
Um, if it really has to do with you, and you evaluate, now, am I at some kind of fault here? Have I done something wrong? Then you can work on fixing that, because that's, that's, that they're being helpful to you. They're pointing out something. If it has nothing to do with you, and you really analyze the whole thing, then you just say, it's theirs. It's their problem, it's not mine, and I don't have to be angry at them or anything. They're in pain. So they're in pain, they're frustrated, something went wrong in their life today that they're lashing out. So even when someone blames you, if you have the time to think about, did I do this thing, or did I not do this thing, or did I, you know, leave something out, then fix it. It's not that, it doesn't shatter your ego to fix something, or to admit you were wrong. Um, and as I say, if, if not, then have some compassion for them, because obviously it's something in their life that's frustrating them, making them feel inadequate, so they have to push it off on someone else. Any other re ways people feel that destroys the balance in their life? Fear. Fear. Fear, Fear always does. Yeah. Impatience. I'm sorry? Impatience. Yeah, fear and impatience do it, okay. Greed. Greed always. Well, desire. Desire. Desire unbalances your life because there's always something more. Fear, what, what do we honestly fear? When I was um, young, and extremely impetuous and did things that were dangerous, I would say, what's the worst thing that can happen to me? I could die. Okay, I'm agree with it. I'm oh, cool with that. And then I would just do what I wanted to do. But I always, what's the worst? To get to what I was really afraid of. One of the worst ones was, I got on top of a mountain, I used to ski, and I got on top of a mountain and there was a straight cliff down and I thought, I can't get down this. And I was scared spitless. And I knew I had to ski down because there was no other way down. And I, so I sat, stood at the top of this mountain and I kept saying, what's the worst that can happen? Now the worst was not dying. The worst was being maimed. But I didn't admit that one. <laughs> that one I wasn't going to admit. So the worst was I could die. And I stood there probably for half an hour having this conversation with myself. And finally I got tired of it. And I just simply pushed off the mountain and went over the edge and made it down to the bottom. Most of our fears are, they're real for a moment, but they, Mostly they're not. They're fear of the unknown. We're afraid because we don't know. And we think we have to know everything. We have to predict the outcome. Know what's possible. What, oh, another time when, I, when we were encountering some kind of fear, we were in Bangkok, and twiddling off with way too much money on us shopping for our bookstores. And we got a rickshaw and we was supposed to take us, put, put, take us back to our hotel. And all of a sudden this man went down this alley. And it was so narrow, you could touch like this on the other side. And I thought, okay, once again, my, my question, what's the worst? Well, we could disappear completely in Bangkok and never be heard of again. And do you know what the man was doing? Keeping us out of the traffic to take us around the, to our hotel. Mm -hmm. Neither of us said anything. We just said, okay, we're here. We may as well just let it play out. And it did. He took us straight to our hotel, no problems. 
But the traffic was so bad, he was afraid we would get hurt in the traffic. So he took us down this dreadful little alley. <laughs> it was fear of the unknown that arises. Almost always. We don't know what's going to happen. And why do we get impatient? Well, we don't know, but what what makes us impatient? We want, we want to know, and we want usually something done or someone to behave in a certain way, and it's taking them too long to do it. Um, I think you know when people want to, uh, when they when they call their children, come in now. And the children, I'm playing right now, I just, in a minute, in a minute, in a minute. <laughs> and we all, everyone's, come on, turn off the TV. Just a minute, just a minute, it's, I just have to see the end of this one. And the moms or the dads get impatient. And then pretty soon the voice gets a little louder. And then pretty soon they walk in and turn it off. <laughs> but. Um, it's because we want something. We either want something to happen or something. Mostly we want something to happen. How often do we get impatient with ourselves? With ourselves, we're quite lenient. We know why we're not there yet. <laughs> right? We know why we haven't quite done it yet. <laughs> And it's a perfectly good excuse. <laughs> but when uh, someone else does it, when we're working yeah. with someone, somehow they're doing it just because they don't want to do it now. <laughs> <laughs> so if we, if we would have the same compassion for others that we have for ourselves, and the patience that we have with ourselves for not getting things done, we probably would lose impatience altogether. However, it's good to be a little impatient and to want things done because otherwise nothing gets done. <laughs> so you have to find the balance of how much to be lenient and how much to hold the hold the criteria, like the lamps up there. And I mean, we had to have it perfectly done. Everything had to be perfectly polished. Everything had to be perfectly clean. But we had a week to do it. So there was really no excuse. We were on our schedules for two weeks. And we had, say, a week to clean. We were on our schedules for two months. And you kept the daily stuff up. But then we had it perfect at the end of the two months for the next person who was coming on the schedule. And plenty of time to do it if we didn't um, distract ourselves with other things. Oh, I don't want to do that. It's just so hard. <laughs> we had, do you know what the numbered windows are? L window louvers? They don't have them. They're slats, glass slats that go like this, oh, yeah. they're illegal and they're not really, they're environmentally not allowed in California anymore because they're too, they don't seal, but the temple is full of them, our house is full of them. And one of the worst jobs was washing the louvers because you have to open them and you're going like this on both halves and you get in a hurry, if you get in a hurry you can get cut. I, the whole thing was just ridiculous, but <laughs> we still have them and we still do it. When we were worried about how we were doing it and how long it was going to take, it's going to take me way too long to get all this done. And we didn't get it done, you know. If we don't think about it, just do I mean, I can probably do them now without thinking and I can probably get half the temple done in half an hour. You learn how to do, when you learn how to concentrate and just do that, 
you can get a lot of work done very quickly and very efficiently. If your mind is scattered and going all over the place, that's when the balance goes. It just goes. And fear, impatience, anger, you know what you're practically naming? The eight feathers. <laughs> Practically naming the eight feathers. One of the ones that I was always amazed at that creates imbalance in your mind and it, shame, which shame was one of them. But the one that I wondered why is it a feather was grief. And why would you why would they why would they name grief as a fetter to realization? Mm -hmm. You're a long time for dauntists. Come on. Mm -hmm. Because we haven't why is accepted grief? it. Because hmm? we haven't accepted it. But why do they call it grief? It's a perfectly normal human thing to grieve. I'm sorry? Makes us weak. It does make us weak, but we are still thinking about ourselves. Us. We're thinking about ourselves. Because the dead are gone. And it's it's a body. And you know that. And to continue unnatural grief is actually self-indulgence because you're not grieving for the person who died you're grieving your well you're wallowing in an emotion for your own satisfaction it somehow feels makes you feel good to do it and i don't know why but we all do it for a little while but th that destroys the balance in our life. I know one person who is still has been grieving for 10 years now and can't get on with their life. And it's really, you know, you just go, come on. You're still alive, you're healthy, you're, you've got everything taken care of, why? This is what destroys our balance, too, is yeah, we have to have that kind of make our, do things that add the closure for that. I think it's, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, we have a wonderful memorial service that was set up, and it takes you from it starts with Sister Nevada to Victorian grieving, everything, totally Victorian, you know, weeping and wailing. And then it goes into asking forgiveness of the person who's gone. Forgive for every omission of everything that you did. Forgive, forgive, forgive. And then it goes straight into Swami Vivekananda on how the soul never dies. And so in 40 minutes, you have been taken through the whole grief process, which many of our members find very, very consoling. They all sit there and they go, okay. And it's the same service every single time. But every time they hear it, they hear a little different something. But I think we have to get to that point where we know that the soul never dies, ever. And that everyone we have ever loved, as he said, is standing in one geometrical point at all times. There is no time, there is no space. They're at one point constantly. And they're always there, and we're always there with them. And this was something Swamiji wrote to one of the one of his, I think it might have been Mrs. Ole Bull when her husband died. And he wrote her this gorgeous letter 
about how how the soul is immortal. Now, if we really believe that, then what do we have to fear about anything unknown? Sometimes I'm afraid when I get in the car and go out on the freeway. <laughs> That's a little iffy out there. <laughs> but rational fears. Watch what they're, you know, keep your eye on everything. That's not a fear of the unknown. That's a fear of what could happen logically and rationally. Fear of the unknown. Fear of the unknown. Yeah. What do they say? Um, you once again use common sense to keep the balance. Tie your camel. Trust in God, but tie your camel. So, balance is absolutely necessary for a peaceful and content life. And until we have that balance, we won't have one. But it's extremely possible to achieve. It's once again, once the things you th you're focusing on, contemplating, is it something you want in your life? Now, I know people who don't want balance. I know people who want chaos, and they keep it going, but it's their choice. So we have to decide, do we want a balanced life? Do we want a, a, a life that goes along quite regularly, or do we want chaos? Do we want just a little chaos once in a while to add? It's like, kind of like adding a chili into a dish. <laughs> Just a little bit, now and then. Something kind of exciting. We call it vacation. <laughs> Doing something totally out of the ordinary. <laughs> right? It's just a chili. Doesn't have to consume the entire dish. <laughs> but I know people who just want a bowl of chilies. <laughs> and I, I still find them extremely tiring to be around. <laughs> they make me tired <laughs> trying to keep up with them. But that realization is difficult. I mean, hmm? They don't realize it or we don't realize that. That we want a bowl of chili. Well, I think after a while you will, you, you, your mouth will burn and then you, pretty soon you go, why is it still burning? <laughs> Yeah, do we want balance in our life? As I say, every once in a while, something out of the ordinary, out of the routine, that's swimming near Malapana who likes to go skydiving. Now, I mean, okay. That's a little chilly in your life. <laughs> Jumping out of a plane. <laughs> Um, but he can do that because he does have a balanced life in all other aspects. You can take those little leaps when you do have balance because they don't upset it. So, in one way, having a balanced life gives you freedom to explore. Freedom to do more. Concentrated, balanced life does give you freedom. And Lord knows, if there are two nations in the world that want freedom, it's India and the U.S. 